I have a student back east who's on the autistic spectrum. And she told me one time she could never understand why Dharma teachers like to extol equanimity as the goal of the practice. And she said it's nothing, not much of a goal. And it's the case that the Buddha himself never said that it was a goal. It's the last of the factors for awakening. And that's led some people to think that that's what the factors of awakening are aimed at. But all the factors are parts of the path. They're meant to lead to something better than they are. They're means to an end. They're tools for arriving at the ultimate happiness. There's no place where the Buddha ever says nirvana is the ultimate equanimity. It's always the ultimate happiness. So the question is, what role does equanimity play on the path? The first thing to note is that sometimes it's regarded as skillful and sometimes it's not. When it makes you lazy, it's not part of the path. But it actually has several functions on the path. One is to apply it to anything that's not directly related to the path, as a way of keeping the mind focused. Issues that have nothing to do with putting it into suffering. Remember, the Buddha himself would put those issues aside, and no matter how many people would try to force him to answer questions that were not related to the end of suffering, he regarded all those issues with equanimity. In other words, he just didn't get involved. He had something he wanted to focus on. So that's one of the functions. For instance, when you're getting the mind into concentration, anything that comes up that's not related to the concentration, you're just going to have equanimity for. Now, this may be temporary. It may be an issue that you have to deal with when you leave concentration. But for the time being, you want to keep the mind on an even keel, not getting worked up about the issue, because otherwise you won't be able to get the mind to settle down. So you have to treat it with equanimity. The other function, of course, is simply to see clearly what you are focused on. This is the purpose of that instruction the Buddha gave to Rahula at the very beginning of his teachings on mindfulness. Make the mind like Earth. Earth is equanimous. You pour good things on it, you pour bad things on it, it doesn't react. Make the mind like water. Use water to wash away dirty things and the water doesn't get upset. Use fire to burn dirty things. Your wind blows dirty things around, and they don't get upset by contact with what's dirty. And this, of course, is prior to his instructions on breath meditation, which are actually quite proactive. So he's not teaching you just to sit there like a cloud of dirt. He's teaching you to have a mind on an even keel, so that whatever comes up, good or bad, you're not blown away by it. Otherwise, you won't be able to see exactly what's going on, because you want to see cause and effect as they actually happen. And if you like some causes and don't like some effects, your view is going to be biased. And certain things that you really should know, you're not going to know because you run away from them, or you pretend they're not there. So equanimity is a prerequisite for seeing things. The word is actually related to another word in Pali, obeka in Pali is equanimity. Abeka is looking at something. And to look at something to see what's actually going on, you've got to get the mind calm, equanimous, so it can Mid what's going on. Now, this relates to another function of equanimity, and that's 
it's a result of something that satisfies you. When the mind is really satisfied, it can look at the world, all the events in the world, with much greater equanimity than it can when it's hungry or irritated or upset. And this is where equanimity gets tricky, because you get satisfied with things and then you just stop. which is not what you want. You want to get satisfied. And if there's more work to be done, can you come from that state of satisfaction in one area and say, well, what about this other area which needs to be dealt with? That's the proper use. But if you don't understand this proper use, you can arrive at some great, great states of peace and equanimity and decide, well, that's good enough. The Buddha talks about this in one of his discourses. Interesting enough, it's one of the ones where he starts the discussion with the fourth jhana, where the meditator already is in equanimity, and then he works up from there, and he gets the meditator to the state of dimension of nothingness. And you can do this several ways. One is just going through the jhanas. Another is to contemplate not-self, seeing that there's no self in any of the six sense spheres. And the mind has this very strong sense of there's nothing, and there's a great deal of equanimity that goes there, and you latch on. You've got to realize that equanimity itself is a fabricated state. It's put together from certain perceptions and certain feelings. And if you look at it from that point of view, in other words, you're satisfied in one area of the mind, but another part of the mind is not yet satisfied. There's got to be something better that we use equanimity properly to go beyond it. Even at this state of awakening, it's necessary as a precondition so you can see clearly what's going on and not overinterpret and not get excited about the fact that you've hit the deathless. You tell yourself, here I am, I'm awakened. That much, the Buddha said, stands in the way. There'll be a very subtle attachment there, a very subtle form of clinging, and you've got to get beyond all clinging. The proper way to react is, oh, there's this, and you watch it. And John Cha talks about the experience, which may have been his awakening experience. He had something that sounds very much like the deathless three times in a row. In each case, he just watched it. Well, where is this going to go now? Where is this going to go now? Which is why he was able to go from one to the next to the next. If he got excited about any of those, he would have been pulled out. But if his equanimity had been such that he was satisfied with what he had before, then he wouldn't have gotten there. He would just sort of stayed where he was. So remember, equanimity has these three functions. One, to clear away distractions. Two, to see clearly what you are focused on. And then three, to give you a sense of satisfaction so that the mind isn't so hungry. And make sure that you use equanimity in each of these ways in the proper way. That's how it becomes part of the path. It is a tool. All of the emotions, or all of the feeling tones, are tools in the middle way. It's another misunderstanding that I've heard sometimes, is that equanimity itself is the middle way between pleasure and pain. But actually the middle way employs all three types of feeling tones. What's special about them is it uses them as tools doesn't regard them as ends in themselves. For instance, with pain. Remember, we sit with pain 
and we use what's called pain not of the flesh to keep us motivated, realizing that here we are, still subject to aging, illness, and death. And there is a state that other people have attained that's not subject to aging, illness, and death. And the realization that it's possible, but you haven't gotten there yet, that is a painful realization, but it's there to motivate you. So you don't just stay satisfied wherever you are. Same with pleasure. We need certain pleasures to survive, and certain pleasures not of the flesh, as nourishment on the path. That's the pleasure that comes from jhana. Same with equanimity. We need a certain amount of ordinary, everyday equanimity to get the mind to settle down. And to take it even as far as the third jhana requires everyday equanimity. So you can see clearly what's going on and react in the proper way. It's only when you get to the fourth jhana that you get to equanimity, not of the flesh. That was the point from which the Buddha himself gained awakening. And it's the ideal place for the mind to see things clearly. It's in the fourth jhana where equanimity is pure and so is mindfulness. And so you're most likely to see things as they actually are happening, for what they are. So even though equanimity is not itself the middle way, it gets used in the middle way, along with pleasure and pain. And again, the issue is, when is it beneficial and when is it timely? Think of the Buddha's strictures for what he would say, whether it's true, beneficial, timely. As far as feeling tones, the Buddha is not concerned about what's a true feeling tone. He wants you to cultivate the ones that are skillful. In other words, here it's simply a matter, matter of beneficial and timely. Is this going to be beneficial and is this the right time and place? For what's pleasant, is this the right time and place for what's not pleasant? When you get a sense of this, then you don't fall into some of the traps that are there in the practice of equanimity. And you can keep the mind on the middle way. Think of Ajahn Mahabhu's definition of the middle way is a practice that's always appropriate. In other words, sometimes you use strong effort, sometimes gentle effort, sometimes pain, sometimes pleasure, sometimes equanimity. What makes it middle is you gain a real sense of what's appropriate. So practice equanimity in an appropriate way. And that's how you arrive at something much greater than equanimity. The Buddha says that after you've attained the ultimate happiness, there is an equanimity with regard to everything else. But that's not on the path. That's something after the path. It's just nothing you have to worry about. What you've got to be careful about is how you practice equanimity and stay on the path at the same time.